thanks very much for joining us for Risk Management, a Process Approach. You can reach me at jim at simplifyiso.com or slide over here to our website and you can reach me through our contact button. If this is the first one of these videos you're seeing, be sure to have a look at the three before this. We started out with an overview, then we went to principles, and last time we did the framework. Now we're getting into the nuts and bolts, if you will, of ISO 31000's approach to risk management. Now make sure you get a copy of the standard. It'll certainly make these videos a lot more useful. As you've heard before, you can either hope that you'll have a good handle on risk or you can add some structure to it as designed in ISO 31000 and give yourselves a better sleep at night knowing that you've done a good thorough job of assessing risk. You can see here in the ISO 31000 model that they've adopted a process approach and it begins here on the left hand side with communication and consultation. Needless to say, the more people you consult with, the more people you communicate with, and the better your team is designed from a cross-functional standpoint, the more thorough your risk analysis will be. More ideas will come out of a cross-functional team, and of course the range of perspectives is much better when you have a mixed group of people. When we get into the scope context and criteria, you already have much of this in place through your management system. The scope of the risk management activities will be defined. Of course, you would do it within the context of your organization, ISO 9001 Clause 4.1, and the criteria you would use for assessing risk could be strategic objectives, business objectives, organizational objectives, health and safety, environment, energy use, all kinds of things. So start with the definition of what area of your organization you want to work with. Maybe think in terms of starting with one area or one context, one scope, and then intending later, if the process works well, expand it to include larger areas. So once you've decided on the scope, then we get into identification, analysis, and evaluation. Once the evaluation takes place, that will lead to the actions that you're going to take relative to the risks that you've discovered. They'll be all relative, of course, to the context, relative to internal issues, external issues, interested parties. They all play a part in what's important and how you evaluate your risk and come up with a decision on what to do next. And that brings us to risk treatment. You can see that obviously in order to treat risk you have to consider such things as available resources to treat the risk. You'd have to decide on what level of risk your organization is willing to accept. One way to avoid risk in certain circumstances would be to not go in the direction that, that has high risk. For example, all car manufacturers today are considering electric cars. As a company, they have to consider the risks associated with it and decide if they want to go down that route or not. One of the risks today, of course, since so many manufacturers have decided to offer an electric car, uh, they one of the risks in the marketplace would be that if you're not there with an electric car, you'll lose out on some sales. On the other hand, depending on your organization, in order to develop the technology, develop a whole new car line, it could be beyond the financial scope of your organization at this time. On the flip side of that coin is the choice to take a higher risk than you're used to and seek out a new business opportunity. Another option is removing the risk source. If it happens to be a very dangerous piece of machinery, you could change the technology or stop offering that product or service that has the dangerous equipment attached to it. When you think of likelihood and consequences, you can change the likelihood by putting protections in place. You can change the consequence by using a different technology or a different approach, a different process. Another option is to offload the risk, outsourcing the service, the process, the product, 
to another party and let them assume the risk. You'll still be responsible for the outcomes. However, you can shift the risk responsibility. And finally, you can accept the risk and retain it by informed decision once you're aware of it. And this brings us quite neatly to the monitoring and review section where you would assess the risk management effectiveness. And remember, uh, ISO 9001 in Clause 9.1.3e has a requirement to assess the effectiveness of your risk management activities, and then it gets reviewed in management review in Clause 9.3.2, Clause E. So assessing the effectiveness is critical, and it'll demonstrate whether you're getting a return on your investment for risk management. It's possible to find that balance between managing risk and not crippling people in the organization, making sure that the risk is managed well, but you're doing it cost effectively. Phil Solomon had an interesting phrase for risks related to environmental infractions. He used the term catnip, and it stood for cheapest available technology not inviting prosecution. And sometimes with safety, sometimes with environments, it's not a bad word to have in your head. And then finally, of course, you need to make sure that you have your activities recorded and you're ready to report them both in Clause 9.1.3 and 9.3.2, just to make sure that it gets some consideration, it gets some evaluation, and you now have, with the recording and reporting, something you can meet these ISO requirements with. Thanks very much for having a look, and if you'd like to see how well our platform can help you manage risk, come on over here to SimplifyISO.com. You'll see this nice big green button. You can schedule a demo. We could spend 10 or 15 minutes and see if this might be a fit for you. Thanks again for joining us, and be sure to check in next time and find out corrective actions. What's in it for me? Bye for now.